Today, we're talking markets and asking whether the Tories under Boris Johnson have fallen out of love with capitalism and free markets. I'm Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. I'm joined by my Reaction colleague, Tim Montgomery. And Tim, you wrote a really interesting piece for Reaction, which was the subscriber newsletter last weekend about this subject. And it was after you'd been talking to a lot of people at the Westminster um, you know, set of parties that finished the this rather bizarre parliamentary year for the for the summer, and there is a lot of disillusionment, isn't there, with Boris's or the direction of the Boris administration on this question, and on the uh, you know just this idea that the Tories are no longer in in love with free markets or free market reform. Absolutely, and obviously there's been a big expansion of the state during the pandemic, but actually you look at the. Um, really some of the differences that caused Sajid Javid, the former chancellor, to leave um, his position. It was because, and this was before the pandemic, if you remember, Ian, um, this was uh, Dominic Cummings really wanting then for there to be a big expansion of the state. And uh, Sajid Javid was wanting to sort of assert fiscal conservatism to some degree. And that really was the row that underpinned why Dominic Cummings successfully, as it turned out, forced him out. And Boris Johnson really took the side of Dominic Cummings then. And the tensions now, they've been evident in the last few days as well, are now again between uh, Dominic Cummings may have gone, but Boris Johnson and his new chancellor, Rishi Sunak, are also um, in tension over Boris's basic uh, wish to keep spending money and I sort of have a, all sorts of theories about why this has happened but I think in his personal life um, Boris Johnson has often had to expand his expenditure and um, we won't go into <laughs> the precise reasons why but I think we all know what they are and he's always managed to you know, get a bit more out of the Daily Telegraph in his contract or done a, another tour of the lecture circuit and he's been able to raise more money and I think for Boris instinctively he just doesn't see um, meeting expenditure is a great problem. You were always a way of getting more income. And, mm. and what it sort of really uh, brought it home to me this week while I was on the um, uh, summer uh, uh, party circuit was with actually uh, Mark Littlewood of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now, I've always been used at IEA meetings over the years as sort of a big government conservative because I'm much less libertarian than, than them. But actually, when we were talking over a glass of... Uh, warmish white wine uh, the other night, um, I sort of had to admit, you know, the expansion of government, the, the, the instinctive belief that we spend to solve problems, the idea that we regulate to solve problems has so become the norm now in Tory circles, I sort of have a lot more sympathy with the IA's concern that we, you know, we need that libertarian, that um, government skeptic dimension in public life. The, the Tories have gone way past me in terms of their belief in the state, in taxation, in regulation. So yeah, Boris always describes himself, doesn't he, as a as a Brexity uh, hezer. Yeah. Meaning that he, he he's like he, he has more in common with with Michael Heseltine than he does with 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 Margaret Thatcher. And Hezer always liked big government schemes. He was instrumental in what happened in the Docklands in, in London, which has been a huge success, a, a, an example of the government intervening or sort of setting the conditions for revival and regeneration. It's more controversial in, in Liverpool. I often think that that sometimes does Michael Heseltine a disservice because actually, if you look at the early to mid 80s before he and Thatcher fell out on the question of Europe, and yes, he, of course, he is. He likes big business and he's corporatist to an, to an extent, but he was in the first wave of Thatcherism. He wasn't he wasn't a wet. He wasn't part of the kind of wet gang that eventually Thatcher had to sort of get had to get had to get rid of and was fighting against in her in her first in her first cabinet. He he was in favour of market reform as well. The thing that I mean, Boris, I can see why he compares himself to Heather in that. There are similarities with the sort of blonde mane and the charisma and all, and all the rest of it. Is that Boris is Boris just really not that interested in economics or business per se? I mean, we know the famous comment and I know, I know why he said it. He actually meant it really about big business 
leaders and their assumptions about about Brexit. But it's just not it, it, it's not really a subject that he has invested that much time in thinking about. Hasn't written about it very much beyond some sort of vague boosterish stuff. And it didn't really motivate Dominic Cummings either. That's another weird thing about Cummings writing. It's, there's this idea that the economy will always sort of take care of itself. That in the Cummings view, there are bigger strategic questions about geopolitics and science and technology and Britain's enemies and the sort of fear and, 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 and you know, possibilities of the future that mean that Kind of mundane economics doesn't really get a look in with um, with with Cummings either. So I, I can see why they ended up forging this this um, partnership. Do you think though is it coming to a head now? Is there a, is there a point at which do you think in the autumn, Tim, around the spending review, the stuff that Sunak's got to do? Is there is there a crunch point? I think so. Um, how soon it will come, I don't know. The mood has clearly changed amongst Conservative MPs. So that will be something that they will worry about or should worry about. Um, Tory MPs almost universally, um, when I was talking to them last week, and of course we haven't been able to do this in the normal way up until now. It was very, so it struck me very uh, forcefully last week that they wonder what is happening to the party of Margaret Thatcher. Um, I think there's also the return of Sajid Javid to the cabinet. Um, I don't know what the new alliances will be, but you essentially have two people, Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid there, who have the Treasury orthodoxy at their heart. Sajid Javid is obviously going to want money spent on the health service, but you still have two people who will now potentially be a counterweight to Boris Johnson, you know, in cabinet discussions. Um, you know, what generally works in most setups, you're right to do, um, say that uh, Michael Hesertine was more complicated than perhaps Boris Johnson understands. But in any good cabinet, and this was true of Margaret Thatcher's cabinet, you did have a diverse range of people. You had fiscal conservatives, you had supply siders, mm -hmm. uh, you had spending ministers. Um, and it's the balance of how they interact that matters. And I think the interaction now of having two, well, one current chancellor and one former chancellor in there, that may matter. And then, you know, while you're away, Ian, I hope you had a good week off, by the way, but uh, the uh, one of the stories last week that most struck me was the fact that uh, because of the rise in inflation and because that so much British government borrowing is tied to inflation and there'll be an extra £10 billion cost to mm. the British exchequer uh, simply because of the rise of inflation, just debt servicing. And if we begin to see a few more things like that, interest rates rise, infl the inflation rate adjusted cost of repaying British government borrowing rises, it'll come to the, a head incredibly quickly. Yeah, I suppose the, the other thing that worries me or gives me, um, yeah, really gives me cause for concern is that some of the stuff that you were writing about, Tim, in your, in your newsletter about market reforms and about making markets work, uh, you know, competition, competition law, um, I suppose you could extend it to trust busting and breaking up, um, you know, excessive monopoly and scale, all of that sort of stuff. I mean, it's it's very difficult to do, and it requires a high level of concentration and a plan, doesn't it? It's it's, some, it's something that has to be driven by. It doesn't necessarily always work. It's some, something that has to be driven by governing intelligence, whether it's mm. Teddy Roosevelt. And his predecessor in the um, in the American prog progressive era, or Margaret Thatcher from a different perspective, and Ronald Reagan in the nineteen eighties. It's not really Boris territory, is it? I mean, it's. I mean, he'll make a speech about ridiculous amounts of red tape and things that we can do differently now that we're no longer in the European Union. But actually digging in and saying, well, how does this fit together in terms of telecoms policy or AI regulation? That's not really a Boris, no. uh, you know, not, not really a Boris way of viewing the world. And then I, I suppose he's going to run into pretty rapidly, and you can see what's happening with the polls already. They're, they do appear to be starting to shift as the vaccine buzz kind of wears wears off a bit. Big arguments about the health service being under pressure and needing more money, and presumably heading for it. Always has a difficult winter, but heading for a particularly difficult winter winter this year so the government will be assailed by a lot of big short-term pressures 
with the opposition reviving a little bit, I think, this, this autumn. And it's, but it's not as though Boris has a sort of governing mission at the heart of it in the way that Thatcher did, because those governments endured the most extraordinary amounts of unpopularity and abuse between election, but did have a mission, and he doesn't. No. Or am I being unfair? I don't think you're being unfair. I, I would broaden it a little bit. I tried to say um, in my last answer to your, your previous question, you know, that Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid could form an alliance. But I think you pinpointed it at the time in your Times column um, after Rishi Sunak's um, budget from earlier this year. You had the um, you had the increase in corporation tax as a sort of the, the hard news element. But actually, you had nothing of the kind that you would have had from a Jeffrey Howe or a Nigel Lawson no. budget from you know the 1980s. There was no, there was no big reform idea. There was nothing, you know, early-ish in the Parliament to be, you know, medicine for the economy that would, you know, begin to, you know, produce some fruits by the time by the end of the Parliament. And so, for my, for me, and this is why I am particularly alarmed about the situation. It's not just the question you've raised about, does Boris have these ideas? The question is, does his chancellor as well? Because that was the beauty of the Thatcher years. You had incredibly big brain people like um, Nigel Lawson, uh, Nick Ridley, and to some extent, Geoffrey Howe. You know, they'd been thinking about these issues throughout most of the 1970s. They'd seen what had gone wrong with Selston Mann in the Heath years. They, you know, these are things that they've been thinking about for a great deal. And I think the problem is, I think this is probably true of Dominic Cummings, it's probably true of Boris, it may be true of a lot of Conservatives. We kind of accepted the, uh, the Thatcher legacy, the economic dynamism it was created as lasting forever, that somehow the British economy had been put right and that yeah. it had been put right for the long term, partly because Labour accepted those reforms, one of the components I tried to address in the in the newsletter. And I think suddenly there may be a realisation, oh my goodness, the economy isn't working, but what we don't have is that thought process that, they, that happened up until before the 1980s that means that Rishi Sunak, Boris Johnson or anyone really has a clue as to, as to how they get it revived again. What do you make of this, this question, which, well, we've both grappled with it for a long time, the question of the unpopularity of capitalism or the need for reforming, or I always think of it in terms of improving, of improving capitalism. Is that, I mean, you know, this has been a, it's been a big problem for a long time on the centre right. I mean, I was one of the people who you know, founded CapEx mm. in 2014, 15, and the backdrop to the group of people who did that, the backdrop was, was concerned that post-financial crisis markets were entering, you know, the idea of free markets and economic liberty were becoming potentially increasingly unpopular among a younger generation. But it's now, people have been talking about reform of capitalism post-financial crisis for, we're close to, you know, soon it'll be 15, 15 years. Do you think that's a, is it a fool's errand? Can markets be made genuinely popular? Um, or is the best that free marketeers like us can hope for is that people accept accept the benefits and acknowledge that the, that the flaws do come with, as I said, huge benefits? I think this is a really crucial question and it, it really gets to the heart of the, 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 the politics of this. And you know, the fact is that at the end of the Thatcher years, although her reforms were accepted, uh, not just by the public, but by her opponents, actually, if you looked at every individual uh, you know, thing like the privatization programs, uh, the reduction of the top rates of marginal income tax, um, generally, you know, the use of, uh, you know, uh, uh, fairly free um, labor markets where worker rights were, you know, had been reduced compared to uh, the, the 1970s. People didn't like them, you know, and there is something inherently uh, hard to understand about a system which relies on self-interest. Um, and I think there'll always be that sort of public uh, suspicion about markets. They don't really understand how they work. They don't like the way they favor the strong and the wealthy. 
um, but they do like the fruits of free markets. And then the reverse is true with planned economies. They like the idea of someone being in charge and it being directed for the public good. Um, so they like the individual idea of um, planned economic things. A lot of the things that uh, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell put forward at the last election were incredibly popular. But it's the opposite of what they think about the free market. They recognize, particularly through experience, that planned economies don't work. And so they don't like the fruits of them. And so the challenge, I think, for conservative, centre-right, parties that are trying to support the free market is to be realistic. We need free markets because of the, the, of the product that they produce, the growth and the jobs that they produce. But don't ever expect to convert people um, realistically to the individual policies how what you need to do is you need to be a full spectrum conservative party it's conservative policies on law and order patriotism educational standards that's what sort of sustains the general public support for a program that will include free market policies but you need that full spectrum range of policies because if you're going you know, rely on you know water privatization or whatever to make the public like um, capitalism you're you're going to lose very badly yeah, and I think it's also that question comes up a lot in, in, in the, they've just reissued Roger Scruton's book, Heretic, which is a collection of essays on, on uh, the environment, economics, arts, literature. And it just, it reminded me, well, firstly, it reminded me what a fantastic uh, writer Scruton, so Scruton missed, was. So, missed, yeah. so, so interesting and thought provoking. But there's something in there about about imperfectibility, which I suppose is at, the, is at the heart of it, isn't it? It's it's when when the when the, the Tories became perceived as being, and this is partly the, the flip side of this is the genius of New Labour of convincing people that you could take the market uh, and make it a bit fairer, or actually not really change it very much, accept the reforms, but then use the fruits of a productive market for. What new labor wanted to do in terms of increased health spending and all the rest of it i mean the irony being that that actually the tories had increased public spending a lot you know over the course of um you know course of uh, of 18 years but still were perceived as being only really interested in 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 in, in markets and only knowing you know knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing in the in the popular misconception so they had allowed themselves to become perceived as being only interested in that in that um, monetary value and, and scruton talks about it in terms of just accepting the the imperfectibility and the and the flaws i mean smith as well doesn't doesn't claim because markets are operated by men and women you know operated by the fallen um operated by people who are by, by themselves imperfect by their own rights imperfectible then you just have you have to accept some sort of some kind of ebb and flow and it's not an easy sell is it no it's not it, it, in term in terms of a popular you know, election rallying rallying cry it's very difficult unless you tr try i suppose you can you can sell it in terms of economic liberty um in its but in its own terms as reagan as reagan um tried to do i mean this is why i'm i'm really interested in what's how keir starmer and labor respond to this but because the conditions should be if the labor party was well organized the labor party should be in a should be in a really good position to take advantage of a major shift leftwards in terms of assumptions about economics and the size of the state something that which i'm really concerned about and you know maybe that's how this plays out politically is that actually the, the, the tories can't really deliver on, on on what people want out of a bigger state and you end up at the next election or the, or the, the election after if labor gets itself into um into an electable condition where people say well you know if if you do want extra fairness and you want more spending and you want it done coherently in a technocratic way then vote labor and yeah. that that could if the if the boris thing goes wrong this could open the door to a labor labor revival you know why why um vote for fake um labor when you can get the real thing yeah and, and i think one of the obvious places where this could you know show itself is, is the housing market 
you know, you've got an oligopolistic housing market effectively in the UK at the moment with a few uh, concentrated house builders who aren't really incentivized to build affordable housing. And so they're not really churning out the kind of housing that people want, certainly not of the, of the beauty that ideally you'd have. And so young people, you know, their most obvious experience, their most, uh, their frontline experience um, with capitalism is a housing market that is clearly dysfunctional, particularly in the rented market. You know, talk to a young person in London and the way they're treated by landlords. You know, there's often gazumping taking place if you can gazump in a rented market. But, you know, their, their, their frontline experience of, um, of that market is enough to turn anyone against um, capitalism. Yeah. And then you could have, you could come in with a labor with a, at least a building, a socialist, you know, council, social housing program that at least built homes that people could afford. And so, um, and that's the way the sort of the, 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 the arguments is presented at the moment. Whereas you and I, of course, would want a dynamic liberated housing market where it was possible for new suppliers to get in, that there would be um, off the shelf housing of the kind that we see in Europe. You know, you'd have a very dynamic housing market and that housing market could beat the social housing market. But unfortunately we are left at the moment to defend this highly regulated, highly oligopolistic market. I keep worrying I can say oligopolistic, so I was just not trying to- <laughs> say it again, it's really, it's really... <laughs> one more time. Well, no, it would be no, the line the time it um, but, but, it's, but it, yes, and the, the other thing is then you'd want a credit market um, that works properly. I mean, this is, this is the other thing, living in an era of endless low rates for reasons we understand, yeah. just always trying to manage the, the aftermath of the last phase of post-crisis recovery means you've ended up with with low rates for far too long and a dysfunctional credit system, which is probably as much, uh, uh, there's some argument about this among economists at the moment, but that it may be that that has more to do, um, uh, that m might have as much to do with, with uh, you know, the huge price surges as, um, as supply problems have. I mean, if, if, if I was in labor shoes, I mean, there is a, a, a scheme that, um, David Garrard, former um, Labour donor under, in the Blair years, proposed, which I've written about quite a few times, which you can, you can actually pitch from a centre-right or, a, or a, a moderate centre-right or moderate centre-left centre approach, which just to sum, summarise it briefly, and Labour, if they were thinking um, smart about this, w would borrow his policy proposal. And that's essentially to create an agency, call it English Homes or an offshoot of English Homes, which is a corporate, you could regionalize it, but they're essentially corporations which build sort of new generation of shared, uh, shared ownership housing with sort of mass purchase, but of land next to motorways and major junctions. And you, you build to really quite, a bit like the Georgians did, in terms of the you know, the, the beauty of the style, the kind of the, the playbook, and there's business then for developers and for new entrants, and then someone buys in and has a share of the equity, which they then take out, and when they move on, and then it's recycled through the pot. So you, there's something you could construct on the basis of 100,000, 200,000 homes a, a year built on a model like that, which would be securitized which would be funded by the city and by international investors and securitized. I mean, it would be a huge, huge opportunity and would give people a share of equity and the next step up on the housing ladder. And you could, I mean, it's a sort of hybrid of, it's not council housing and it's not pure shared ownership. But if Labour did something like that, um, you know, that, that's going to sound much more attractive than the, I, I can't quite see the way out for the Tories at the moment this because they're not going to get the planning reforms through. Essentially, they're going to go into the next election with the system as is, plus a knackered credit um, market for the reasons we discussed earlier. So I think on housing, they're potentially heading for problems and on, um, and on, and on, the, uh, and on the NHS. So we've come a long way here talking, Tim, about, um, you know, pure, pure market reform. But uh, 
let me just play devil's advocate for a second, just sort of final, final question. Boris has still got a majority of 80. The Labour Party is still in a terrible mess. No sign of it coming back in any serious way in Scotland yet. He still has plenty of time. It's a long time until the next general election. The economy may be on an upswing and may surprise on the upside even more once um, once we emerge from the from the from the pandemic from the pandemic. So he's potentially in a very strong position. Does he really need to worry about any of this? Isn't this just sort of people like you and me and think tank people and columnists fretting about the direction of conservatism and he'll just carry on winning? Um, I think the chances are that he will carry on winning. Um, I think, um, and I, I'm not sure I would, if I was in Downing Street at the moment, I'm not sure, given that we're already two years into the parliament, I would now embark on any big reforms anyway, it's, you know, because you'll start to offend all the vested interests. The, you'll, you'll confuse people without having any of the benefits of those reforms. We, we have wasted um, the last two years of the, of the parliament, the first two years of the parliament, really. And I don't take the pandemic as an excuse for that. You know, the, um, in the World War II, um, Attlee and Churchill were able to come up with things or were able to enable things like the beverage report to be written. You know, you can do big thinking and other things at the same time. And yeah. if, frankly, there isn't a sort of outline of a reform program at the Conservative Party conference this autumn, I think we can fairly well conclude that there isn't going to be one in this parliament. Um, but so, you know, so yes, the politics of this may be to not, you know, sh to rock the boat very much at the moment and carry on with things like Boris has been announcing today, which is introducing, you know, public chain gangs for criminals. You know, that seems to be where the Conservative mm. Party is, is going. But, you know, um, the polls have tightened a lot recently. You know, leads of double digits have become leads of about 5%. That's happened incredibly quickly. That would make me a little bit nervous if I was a Conservative MP. I can't see, because of what you mentioned, the Labour problem in Scotland, Labour getting an overall majority. But it's far, it's now certainly possible and conceivable to see the Tories losing their majority at the next election. Till take some, because 80-seat 80, 80 majorities are not a small thing, but yeah. it's no longer, no longer impossible. Is that point also, you just listen to you talk that, uh, Tim just reminded me, and we've long, long agreed on this. The point is not just winning. Um, it's not just a. It shouldn't be a tribal battle. There's more to it than that. There is the, there is the future of the country at stake. And you know, if, if these, if people don't push on this stuff, and 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 the right choices aren't made on housing, on reforming the NHS, on credit markets, financial services, competition in the economy, one year drifts into the next. And before you know where you are, you're in the middle of middle of the decade and um, an opportunity is lost. So I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And on reaction, we will keep pushing on all of that and discussing and debating all of these themes. If you're not a subscriber to reaction on YouTube, it's really straightforward. Just hit the subscribe button below. And if you're not a subscriber to Reaction on the site where you get our brilliant uh, briefing from the team every day on the story that we think matters and links to very smart stuff to read and all the brilliant journalism from our team and you get my weekly newsletter and you get Tim's work as well and these, these videos and Reaction subscriber events. So all of that you get as a Reaction subscriber. Details are in the bio below. You can get a what are they waiting for in? What are they waiting what? for? What are they waiting for? Why aren't they subscribing? <laughs> details, details below. Try a 30-day free trial and become a reaction subscriber. But until next time from me and Tim, thank you for joining us.